Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this exciting session. Um, our session is called uh, Transnational Collection and Connections, but actually we won't talk too much about collections, but more about uh, heritage issues uh, concerning transmission, uh, lost also, restoration, reinterpretation, and uh, maybe something that's um, really uh, reflected when I read all the papers, uh, the tension between uh, laws and policies and grassroots, grass, grassroots uh, practices and knowledge to preserve heritage. Today, uh, our um, speakers are both practitioners and researchers, uh, most of them working at the, the, uh, the, the interconnection of uh, these two aspects of heritage, which uh, will be very, uh, very clear in, a, in their papers. So just to remind you that uh, you have 15 minutes uh, each for your presentation. Uh, I as we are uh, quite a lot, quite a, a great number of uh, speakers to, for this session, uh, I will uh, remind you when it is one minute left and when it is uh, time to conclude with four <laughs> papers. Um, and I first give the floor to Fiona McKenzie, who is uh, both a Gaelic singer, a heritage practitioner and a protector, who will speak about her practice. Thank you, Fiona. That was a traditional Gaelic lullaby from South Uist in the Outer Hebrides, collected by John Lauren Campbell, or Fer Cana, a Cana man, whose grave you can see here on the tiny island of Cana in the Inner Hebrides. John arrived in the Outer Hebrides on the 4th of August, 1933, um, a date which marked the beginning of what we now know to have been an extraordinary life's work of recovery and transmission of the Scottish Gaelic song, literary and linguistic record. He was to become one of the world's foremost Scottish Gaelic scholars and folklore collectors, together with his wife, Pittsburgh-born Margaret Fee Shaw. Born into a family background of privilege and landowning wealth in deepest Argyll in 1903, John rebelled from his structured upbringing when he began to explore this unusual world of the Hebrides, which was then in his own words, like the old highlands of the early 19th century. And he continued on to become a pioneer of the modern collection and preservation of Gaelic song and story from the Hebrides. Together, John and Margaret amassed one of the world's most important collection of Gaelic song, photography and folklore, which includes an archive of 1500 original field recordings made between 1934 and 1965, which now lives in the archives of Canna House on the island of Canna in the Inner Hebrides and curated by the National Trust for Scotland. The collections present a unique testament to the vigour and foresight of pre-eminent 20th century Gaelic scholarship. The recordings and visual records captured um, vital elements of traditional Gaelic culture, then still alive in Uist, Barra and Nova Scotia. The Campbells formed a very close relationship with Nova Scotia and in particular with Cape Breton, another island. Their first trip there was in 1937 when they travelled there by car 
for six months collecting songs and Margaret taking photographs of the landscape and the contributors, who were not always Gaelic contributors, as you can see in the photograph. The clearances had a major impact on the movement of a culture from the Western Isles, particularly to North America, and in this case, particularly to Nova Scotia. And this increased greatly after the 1812 war with the US, when that route was effectively closed to immigrants, so they went to Canada instead. In Cape Breton, settlers from Barra concentrated around the Barra Street and the Bradog, while South Uist went mainly to Grand Myra and the Boysdale and East Bay areas. North Uist went to Catalone, Gabarus and Myra, while Harris went to the Grand Rivers, Framboise and St Anne's. There were few, few settlers from Lewis at this point, and these were concentrated at Little Narrows and at St Anne's. Any visitor to the islands today will be struck by the acres of graveyards given over to Scottish names. The bottom right image is John Lorne Campbell standing on the at station at Boysdale, Cape Breton. There are a few songs that have travelled so far, they have retained lyrical and melodic integrity and crucially audience interest to the extent that the song I started with today has. It's a lullaby here, but it is also a good example of culture transforming or mutating as it travels. This song was collected by Margaret and John both in South Uist and then in Nova Scotia in 1933 and 37 respectively. It's called Durham and literally travelled from Loch Boysdale to the island of South Uist and to Boysdale, Cape Breton. But how did this happen and how did it change as it crossed the ocean? Interestingly, Margaret uh, draw, drew reference to the likeness of this song um, to one contained within the Carmen Agadelica. Volume 5, where it's called Guren. Incidentally, there is a place called Portion of Guren in Lewis, but whether or not there's any connection with the song is pure conjecture. The similarity in scanning and fit with words is obvious, and following verses of Gurin have similar themes in both Margaret's and John's verses. Peggy, who you saw in the picture earlier, this is her version that you're seeing here. This was collected by Margaret in Folk Songs and Folklore um, of South Uist. It's a fairly simple structure set in the key of D major and is set in simple 3-4 uh, time. The structure follows the common Gallic style of the chorus and verse having practically the same melody with minor differences. The whole song has only two instances of a dotted rhythm and the range is maintained within an octave. Margaret's version, on the other hand, comprises chorus and two verses only. And the barstock, which is the word for lyrics of poetry, and though it's sung liltingly as a lullaby as I did, it has the feel of a song of praise for a fine young warrior, but sung as though a lullaby. Many Gaelic songs are difficult to transcribe with unusual modes and lack of time signature, but Margaret, as a trained musician, possessed the rare ability to hear these and manually take them down. It's a song sung of the fine young nobleman sung to a baby, and this was a common de device in Gaelic song to transmit a message without directly voicing it. In politically unstable times, sometimes used as a warning to people to stay away, as danger was afoot or to mourn a murdered husband. The, the number seven, of course, is a common motif in Celtic barstock. This is John's version of the same song, collected in Cape Breton, Antigonish County in 1937 on the 20th of October, from the well-known singer and piper, Angus Ridge MacDonald, whom you see in the picture there. O Juram, me Juram, O Juram, Mono, O Juram, me Juram, O Juram, O E, O Juram, me Juram, O Juram, Mono, 
Kedaki jurum bekuanak makruari namam. Here is John's transcription in his uh, notebook from that day, cat doodles included. <laughs> and the first difference to be noted are the different verses. Margaret's two verses are quite different to John's two. The structure of the lines is the same, and the lyrics can equally well be sung to the tune of Margaret's version. Here is, is one of John's verses to Margaret's tune. Oh, little my kaiganabin and jay, but mission get a bird's doing your flapping dog in. Let cool the girl go up to for a scatter in the fee. Who can do her so tahir be tahir and yin? So it fits very well. Now listen to Angus Ridge MacDonald's fine signals, the uh, singing of the original melody. The musical structure is again simple, set in simple 3-4 three, four, three, four time again, which is a popular time signature for songs intended as lullabies due to its lulling waltz like rhythm. This time it's set in the key of G, fairly simple step melody, with the addition of a few more dotted rhythms than in the U.S. version. The range is greater, almost two octaves, as opposed to one and a more technically tricky melody in line three. The melody sticks are rigid, rigidly to the same for the chorus and the verse than the US version does. But there's still the same melodic jumps as in Margaret's version. And if the two versions were to be sung back to back, they would pretty much fit together in terms of structure, dynamics and meter. The chorus here says, O oh, Jurem, rather than She Jurem, as in the other version. Then, however, there's an undeniable likeness between the two versions. L lyrically, John's version is pretty similar in tone. Still, Mathgruery, who is the hero, although I think it's more of a lullaby than a hero worship song. Now here is one of Margaret's verses sung to John's tune. Of me she shall clean us, me shown them down. Can who can give her, can deny her in life. Me shall so she re, but drecken on my. For being a lullaby sung by women to a song sung more generally by men on the other side of the oceans. It's particularly interesting indeed that when Judah crossed the ocean and the performance demographic, demographic focused on men rather than women, we have an altered representation of the entire Gaelic song culture in Nova Scotia. When the emigrants <laughs> left Scotland and reached the new country, it was usually men who gathered in the glens and remembered the old country, conducting tweed walkings, whereas in Scotland it was always women who carried out this activity. But in Scotland it was for economic benefits, whereas in Nova Scotia it was a social activity. We're well aware of the transmutation of other song styles, such as walking songs or luog, sung in Scotland by women, but sung by men in North America. But little has been done to examine the adaptations of other song styles, such as lullabies like this. From a linguistic and dialectal point of view, we can see how language changes when removed from its community roots and immersed in a new environment, both a physical environment and a cultural. And we see how particular words change, absorb local character and change meaning and spelling, but still refer poetry and tradition. 
These are folk songs, but does this mean that their social and cultural significance is lessened any by being of a folk or tribal origin? What does folk even mean? We learn a lot from examining the ways people preserved their heritage and culture. Separated by oceans, with no social media to rely on, the songs still retain the story, the meaning and the personality of the people who made them in the first place. The Campbell's legacy in Canna House, including this lullaby, is testament to the respect and vision they possessed for their own adopted heritage and culture. We should do the same, absorb the nuance and language indigenously placed. And lastly, a question, this legacy, should we be conserving it or developing it? Durham has come full circle, back from whence it came. Population. Thank you very much.